Hi, you're checking in. <laughs> checking in. Yep, real good band out of Mississippi. Everyone should definitely check them out. And it uh, looks like we're going to get ready here to uh, bring on our second guest for tonight. Yes. Um, and let's bring him on in. We've got guitarist Mike Spritzer from Groove Metal Maven's Devil Driver. We're getting ready to release the band's ninth studio album. It's volume one of the double album titled Dealing with Demons, out October 2nd through Napalm Records. What's going on, Mike? Thanks for coming on with us tonight. How you doing? Good. How you guys doing? Oh, good. Not bad, man. Are you, uh, are you here in California? How's the apocalyptic... Uh, scene out there looking with all those fires going on down there it looks very apocalyptic it's right very yellow <laughs> brown yeah. and there's ash everywhere but uh mm. i'm one of the lucky people luckily my house is not in any danger because i'm not i'm in an area that's not near any hills or shrubs or mm. anything that could burn so gotcha man cool. my biggest worry is earthquakes and tidal waves um, yeah <laughs> we got none of them right now so that's good yeah <laughs> cool man well you guys are getting ready to release you know the first of two volumes for the new double album dealing with demons and man what a, a release it is man it's phenomenal me and chris were just you know talking about it before the show i really I, it's one of my favorite from the band probably since one of your earlier albums um and um you know in terms of uh you know it's it's the, the way the record is, it's very heavy. Not so, not so much. You know, obviously the music's heavy, but in terms of its lyrical sentiments, I mean, it's really the album title. I think is really a great representation of, you know, what ex, uh, the listeners can expect to hear. It's precise, it really, really matches the overall mood of the record. You know, uh, musically also, there's some noticeable changes I noticed too. I mean, in terms of the tempo, still got that vintage Devil Driver sound, but definitely more of a, a mid tempo twist to it on some of the songs. So did you guys write the music, uh, you know, purposely? Was it written that way to sort of fit the overall semblance of the album, knowing that it was going to be sort of very personal and deep lyrically? So therefore, you know, slowing things down a bit, it allows it for, you know, like a more of a sullen and eerie aura to sort of represent itself in the songs? You know, I can't really comment a whole lot on the lyrical content because, you know, that's a question for Des. Sure. I, get that, I get that question a lot, but... The way things are done, I'm never lately. So back in the day, I used to be around when Des was doing vocals because we'd all go out to outside of El Paso, Texas, to this place called Sonic Ranch and record the the whole album there. And I would be around for you know everyone would be around for everything, but mm. we kind of do it spread out now. You know, we do a lot of the demoing at my studio, and then. We, you know, we went to Steve Evitt's studio and finished everything up there. And then Steve goes to Dez's house to record okay. the vocals. Dez bought himself a vocal booth and he just does it there. But regarding the music, it's funny that you mention things seeming a little bit more mid-tempo. And before Neil and I started writing for this record, we were on the tour bus. And that was actually the very first thing we discussed. And it was, we're going to slow things down a little bit. You know, and mm. just because it's a, a slower tempo doesn't necessarily mean this. You know, this, <laughs> you know, the this, this song's any less brutal or anything like that. But oh, I sure. actually kind of found, you know, on slower tempos, and you know, there is more fast tempo stuff on it. But in slower tempos, mm. you can kind of squeeze more stuff in it. And mm. I've never gone into the mindset of doing that. I usually toward the end of a record or toward the end when I'm on like. Okay, I'm gonna write two or three more songs, and I'll kind of I'll go back, and I'll look at you know what key most of the songs are at, and I'll look especially look at all the tempos that you know that we've done, and you know if everything's you know hovering around 170 or 180, I'll go back and I'll write something in 120 or 150 or something like that, you know, just to make sure that we have a diverse selection of songs for people to listen to. Mm -hmm. all right. Cool. Well, you just mentioned uh, Steve Evitz, um, who I know he produced your guys' last uh, release, the Country Covers album, Outlaws Till the End. But this is now the band's first studio release of new songs without Mark Lewis, who worked with you know you guys for a pretty lengthy period of time there. I think he produced the pr band's previous uh, three new full lengths. So tell us a bit about your experiences working with Steve, who's such a you know world-renowned uh, producer in the metal world. And what did he bring to the table on dealing with demons that made it really such the, the great record that it is. He has a, a different approach than Mark Lewis does. And both are great. You know, it, mm. it was when we decided to 
go with Steve over Mark. I mean, it was it was not an easy decision because Mark, if there was a you know a sixth member of Devil Driver, it would be Mark because mm -hmm. right. he's been with us and done so much work for us over the years, and I still talk to him a lot. You know, we're we're really really tight, but Steve is located about 30 minutes from my house. He's really close. And one of the big things, especially for Neil, um, he has produced a lot of Neil's favorite bands. So Neil was really excited to work with, with Steve. And I didn't really know a whole lot about him at first, but we became friends really close or really, really fast. And But he has... Like, one of the main things I noticed as a guitar player is with Mark and almost every every record we've done in the past, we've either used, for the most part, it's one person playing the rhythms on a song, and there's, it's the same guitar tone on the left as it is on the right side. And right. Steve has, you know, and like one or two microphones set up on the, on the cab. In this case... <laughs> With Steve, we literally brought in probably 10 different amplifiers, two cabinets with six mics on each cab. We wouldn't use every mic on each one, but he just has more of a way of doing this thing called analog summing where he blends all the mics into a summing box and then you kind of just commit to it into Pro Tools. And he wanted Neil to play on one side and I, and have me play all the rhythms on the other. So all the songs on Dealing with Demons, what well, you're hearing, all the rhythms are both me and Neil playing together. And Devil Driver's never done that before. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it ended up working out really, really well. And the other thing that he insisted on was that we do pre-production as a band. And not so much with Dez. I mean, he was there in and out from time to time, but it was just me, Neil, Austin, and Steve two straight weeks in a rehearsal, rehearsal space out in Chino, California, just cutting the fat from these songs, doing them in different tunings, speeding them up, slowing them down, uh, and just trying new things before we just went into the studio and, you know, started recording the final product. Sure. Cool. Now, do, do you find that you need an outside person like Steve, I mean, you're an engineer, you're a, you could produce a, a record, obviously, you know, do, does having that extra person give you a little more freedom to just concentrate on the music? And it, yeah, people have asked me in the past if I would ever produce a devil driver record. And my answer has always been no. Okay. Because I like that outside influence because as a writer, you're too close to the music because you see it differently than the listener does. And even sure. a producer, you know, they're gonna see things, they're gonna have suggestions that none of us would probably think of. And, you know, that rings true with every producer that we've ever worked with. And um, I think that's important in the long run. And Steve is, he's been doing this for so long. And there's another thing I love about Steve is he's been doing this for so long that he started in the days where he was recording the tape. And okay. so you kind of got this guy that's old school and new school, and he's just this hybrid mixed into one. And I just love it, you know? And I also, I've, I've learned so much from working with Steve that, you know, it's, work, working with Steve is priceless. I, I Honestly, don't think that Devil Driver will ever work with anyone other than Steve ever again. Oh, wow. Excellent. Very cool. Now, um, Mike, talk a little bit about the vast number of just ideas that you guys had for this. There's obviously two volumes that are, there's a second volume coming, and and there's this one that has, a you know, a full collection of songs. What was it this time that, that not only... Get, you know, obviously bands always have ideas and some of them don't make a lot of records. What was it this time that where you felt like the material was strong enough that you couldn't really cut any of it and you needed to have a second volume to it? We went in knowing that we were going to do a double record. It wasn't that we had, I mean, we did have leftover material. We did write, you know, quite a bit more than what made one of the two records, but you know, it's, uh, we went in knowing that we were going to do 20 songs. And okay. we, had, we had more than that, but it's, it's this, 
you know, it's kind of a a vote at the end. You know, everyone got all the songs, and you know, Steve had some influence on uh, which songs we were gonna do, which ones we weren't. You know, sometimes you know, like when we were in Chino doing pre-production, we'd be playing them, and it's just like, yeah, let's not do this one. Everyone's digging this one a little bit more, so mm -hmm. it's just. You know, and we get along so well, the band. There's never any arguments anymore. And, you know, when suggestions are made, no one gets bitter. I think we're all older, wiser, more mature. Right. And it's, it's a much easier process now than it was a long time ago to narrow it down to what we're going to do. Sure. And so so then how how did these songs make volume one versus the, the songs that made volume two? Was it... Was it just the way it sequenced up, or or did you feel like there was some sort of a loose theme musically to to the song? No, I think they all could have gone on one record. It's you know kind of the same way I'd look at Guns N' Roses' "Use Your Illusion" one and two. Like any of those songs, I think would fit on either record. Sure. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think they could have cut the fat from those two records and put them all on one record. Right, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> That's yeah. just my opinion. Yeah. Because I think there's some fillers in there, even though they're both great records. But um, Neil came up with a, I think he was the first one that came up with a track listing. And okay. he just sent it out. And I think Dez and the record label might have made a couple changes on it. Because there's actually nine songs on volume one, eight on volume two and i believe there's probably gonna there's so there's three leftover songs which i believe are going to come out as an ep after volume two so we've got plenty of stuff to release but neil made the track list i looked at it and i'm like yeah i'm cool with this pass it on to Dez, see what he thinks and uh that was pretty much it you know it wasn't uh for me the most important things are the first four tracks and how it ends, mm. which probably isn't the best way of thinking about things these days because a lot of people don't listen to records. You know, they're mm -hmm. listening to EPs or um, just picking out songs they want to listen to. And I kind of wonder sometimes if people even make it through a whole record these days because everyone's attention span is so much shorter than what it used oh, yeah. to be. Right, sure. But, yep. uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the other thing too is like I like I do put the songs into iTunes and listen to it from start to finish. Okay. And if I don't have time, if I'm <laughs> and I'm in a hurry, I'll at least listen to see how the songs transition to one another. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I won't like the way it feels, and you know I'll mix things up. But when Neil sent me the track list and I did that, and I was like, yeah, everything flows nicely. I'm totally cool with this. And it's just like, you know done and done sure nice very cool yeah well also the new record uh mike it also marks the second now full length that you're doing with austin neil and diego who all came on board for trust no one in 2016 how challenging was that going back to i mean how challenging was it working with that many new additions at once during the recording process of trust no one and what and what have the guys really brought to the table that might have been lacking or missing with the older lineup since they've joined the band lacking nothing um, Des brought Neil and Austin over to my house to audition for the band and Austin was already kind of a, a done deal because Mark mm -hmm. Lewis suggested him he had just quit Chimera um, he also lives about 30 minutes away from me super close and we just heard nothing but good things about him and I really really trust Mark's opinion and he, Mark wasn't like Oh, uh, you know, you should check out Austin. He was like, this is your guy. Don't look any further. Just hire him. We're like, okay, done. Hired. We didn't even try him out. <laughs> and when I first met Austin, it was just like one of those situations where we were just friends instantly. And mm. when Neil came in, I made him play uh, the song Dead to Rights, the opening track off Beast, because it's one of the harder right. songs. And like, if he can play that song, then he can play any song that we throw at him. And I didn't expect him to learn the solo, too, but he did. And he just played the whole thing from start to finish perfectly. And I was like, yeah. And Des really, really wanted Neil in the band. They were they had been friends for, like, maybe two years. 
I was a little skeptical because Neil used to play with David Cook from American Idol. That was the, the last band he was in. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. And I was like, I don't know how the metal community is going to react to snagging David Cook's, you know, or a guy from American <laughs> Idol's guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, you know, it was. Looking back, that was a pretty stupid concern of mine, but it was a concern. Mm -hmm. And because I, you know, guitar players are a dime a dozen, but you know, I wanted to find someone that was in the LA area, and honestly, no one came to mind that I wanted to be in the band. Not a single person, sure. you know, because it's not yeah. only about playing guitar; it's about getting along with them and vibing with them and all that stuff. But so Des basically shoved us into a room and said, start writing a record. And I had already written most of Trust No One at that point, but I wanted to bring some other, you know, ingredients into the record. Right. And it was just like a match made in heaven, man. You know, like Diego doesn't write with us. He's more of just a touring guy. But me, Neil, and Austin, I mean, we just get along and we have so much fun writing. It's, I've never had more fun writing with people in my whole life it's just it's easy it's fun they're both extremely talented and we all have our strengths and weaknesses and mm. it's like whoever has the weakness someone else can compensate for it and it's mm. it's just perfect and then when we brought steve into the mix it just made things even better awesome oh, fantastic man well devil driver you know you guys were one of the biggest driving forces during that whole you know the new wave of american heavy metal movement during the mid to late 2000s which saw bands like yourselves and a slew of others just kind of really dominate the metal world globally during that time period and then some uh, some months back me and chris we actually uh, did a podcast with a few of the guys from chimera and they talked about what a great experience and you know what a great experience that was and how most of the bands really bonded so well during that time uh, if you don't mind, just you know, talk a bit about what that experience was like for you being part of that movement in terms of the connection that the bands and musicians all made with each other. I mean, do you feel that many of the newer and up-and-coming bands today, do they have that similar sort of ethos as that movement did when you guys were all coming up, or do you find that's maybe a bit more competitive and separate these days? I don't think it's changed much. I mean, the metal, the metal community, I think, is much different than a lot of other genres. I mean, mm -hmm. for the most part, we're a bunch of nerds that grew up without having a lot of friends, and so <laughs> we learned how to play an instrument, you know? So sure. Most people in the metal industry, I mean, even like, you know, like the guys in Slipknot and Metallica, and, you know, almost everyone is very humble. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone's just very grateful that to be doing what we're doing. And, but... Looking back on the days when, like, you know, like, Sounds the Underground 2005, you know, there was mm. you know, All That Remains, Chimera, Clutch, you know, a whole bunch of bands. And actually, I used to wake up every single day, and um, Chimera used to get Coronas on their rider. And for some mm. reason, we had, like, Bud Light or something like that. And I just would rather have Coronas. So every day, Matt mm. from Chimera would come over to my bus, and we'd exchange <laughs> nice, like, nice. Here's your Bud Light. Give me my Corona <laughs> almost every single day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's you get really close with the other bands really fast because you're out there. You know, most of us are drinking every day, and that just breaks down the walls, and you just become friends sure. really right. quickly. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I tell people too is. You become friends with these people because you get them in small spurts. So right. you might right. actually, if they were your roommate, <laughs> and you had to deal with them on that kind of level, you prob probably wouldn't like a lot of the people. <laughs> yeah. but you, so you get the best parts of people because you're only getting them in small spurts. You know, they're not opening right. up and you know, no one's like really showing them true selves. But I kind of like mm -hmm. it that way because everyone gets along better. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean... The whole thing is, you know, go play music, have fun, go wreck a city and leave and go to the next one. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you guys, you know, you're talking about doing that with the bands. You guys have kind of done that with the fans as well a lot. You know, I remember one time specifically when I was, when I was doing uh, the metal show on WMMS here in Cleveland 
and we did the barbecue with you guys where we had like 10 fans and and it was it it was on the side of the agora and um and we had a little grill and and we were like grilling out and and you guys you guys were just hanging out and having fun and like the thing I remember most was that the fans were scared to death to come up to you guys. I was hanging because I'm, you know, I'm a radio guy. So I was like completely comfortable, but all the fans were like standing up against a wall all by themselves. And I remember specifically you going over to them and saying, the fuck are you guys doing? Grab a beer. Let's go. Let's have a party here. You know, and, and it, that's always been kind of how devil driver has been. It's always been a band that really was not, two separate from i mean you obviously have to have distance from the fans at some point but you guys always seem to have that kind of camaraderie you built a camaraderie based band instead of uh we're the stars and you're the watchers type of an element you know yeah it was fun um i can't i was more like that definitely in my my 20s and my early 30s the older i get i'm finding <laughs> uh, i don't like hanging out quite as much as i used right. to Sure. I still do, but just not every day. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think all of us were just ecstatic to be out on tour. You know, I mean, I started doing it when I was 23 years old, which is pretty sure. young. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I was over the moon, you know, still am. Mm -hmm. Just let's go out, let's have fun, make sure the fans that are paying their good money, make sure they have fun. And uh, shit, you know, more mm -hmm. the merrier. Right, exactly. Now, um, now, Mike, the one song on the new release that really jumps out at me, and I'm sure everybody's asking you on this song, is "Wishing." The uh, and it's the vocal. It's the the clean vocal is so out of left field for this band. Was that just something that you guys wanted, or Des wanted to to do, or or what? You know what? How did it come up, come to be? I'm not 100% sure about this, but I'm pretty sure Steve pushed Dez in the direction to do that because I was caught off guard by it, too. When I first heard it, like, I, you know, I wasn't there when they recorded it. Okay. As, as they finished the songs, they would send them to me, Neil, and Austin. And, you know, so we can just a rough mix of it so we can hear what Dez did. And at one point, I remember Dez thinking he should change that, that verse to something okay. a little bit more brutal. And my immediate reaction was, you know, I text him like, dude, not only should you not change this, but this should be like the third or fourth song that we release from this record. Because, right. and, you know, I, I, I took him back to sale when we released that. That wasn't supposed to, originally, I was the only one that wanted that on the record. Right. And... Everyone's like, yeah, it's too mellow, blah, blah, blah. Look, just put it as the very last song on Winter Kills. And I'm like, if Pantera can cover Planet Caravan and put it on the last song on Far Beyond Driven, sure. why can't we do it? Mm -hmm. And luckily I I won that argument and put it on <laughs> one, one of our bigger songs, you know? Right. It's, yeah. it's a little bit bittersweet because it's a cover, but kind of hoping the same thing happens with wishing and it won't be so bittersweet because it's uh it's an original right mm -hmm. yeah Not but i don't think the public has heard that yet i don't think it's been released has it no no yeah, i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to share it yet but I, no. i'm just saying that is <laughs> we we've heard it and and it, it it really is the the proverbial curveball after a bunch of hundred mile an hour fastballs, you know. Yeah, and I think you know, Des when, when Devil Driver first started, he, Des really had to get away from the whole cold chamber thing. Sure. Back not not so much anymore. It's almost like new metal is kind of coming back a little bit. But two thousand four to like two thousand ten, new metal was like a was a word you didn't want to mention. Right, and we had a lot of fans coming up to us when we would do our signings at festivals and whatnot, saying, "You know what? I've never seen you guys before. I've never heard you guys before because I just didn't want to like you guys." And I think after we released "Fear of Our Maker's Hand" and "Last Kind Words," everyone 
it, the first record was almost like a transition from Cold Chamber mm -hmm. to Devil Driver. At least that's the way I look at it. And I wasn't on that record, so I have a different way of looking at it than that Des does, and and you know the guys that were in the band at the time. But so it was always, you know, I don't want it to sound anything like Cold Chamber. I want it to be brutal. I want it to be brutal, fast, heavy. You know, um, Des wasn't really into the intro of um, End of the Line for a while. Okay. It obviously it grew on him, but he was concerned. And it's just like, you know, all these clean guitars, and he just wanted to go balls to the walls, you know, heavy all the time. But I think enough time has passed. You know, we were playing Cold Chamber songs on the last tour, and they went over great. And right. I was a little against that at first, but once I saw the crowd – you know, a crowd reaction. I put my foot in my mouth. And, <laughs> you know, I think we've gotten to the point now where everyone's like, let's just do whatever the fuck we want. Right. You know, it's like people are going to, people are going to hate or love whatever we do anyway, you know, and I don't write music for other people. I write it for myself. And mm -hmm. if people like it, they can like it. If they don't like it, they, they don't have to go listen to something else. I don't care. But, you know, if we're just writing music to satisfy the masses, what's the point? Yeah. You know, if it's not making me happy, then I don't want to do it. So I think we've finally gotten to that point where it's just like, yeah, we can throw the fans and curveballs and let's see what happens. And I think when we do, like Sale, for instance, right. sometimes it, it goes in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no doubt. Well, speaking of you know, Des and, and Cold Chamber, I mean, it looks like for now, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, the band may not ever get back together again. And and you know, and, and although that's just the nature of how things work, when you're one of you know, one of your main band members has a profile and resume like he does, it definitely has its speed bumps when a band member decides to start a new project or reunite with a previous one. So, I mean, how challenging is it when when you've had to deal with that in the past? knowing that one day the band could be put on hold for something like that to occur uh, when you've got a guy like Des in your band who, you know, could potentially have to do a tour, do a tour with, uh, you know, Cole Chamber. Well, when he decided to do the Cole Chamber reunion, I actually welcomed it because mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, for the most part, up until that Cole Chamber tour, when they, uh, their, their reunion, we were on tour six to nine months out of every year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I can use a little bit of time at home and, mm -hmm. you know, stay home. You know, all my, my nephews and my niece had <laughs> pretty much completely missed them growing up for the most part. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was just nice to stay home and stay grounded and just take a break from the road, you know, just, do things that I wanted to do, produce, mix, work with other bands, you know, mm -hmm. go surfing more often and, right. you know, maybe, you know, take some trips here and there. You know, I spent a lot of, during that time, I spent a lot of time in Australia. You know, I went to uh, El Salvador a couple times and, uh, you know, just got to do things that I never really got to do because I was so busy with Devil Driver. Mm -hmm. And I also used that time to build my studio. You know, right. I I just moved into a house and, you know, I've been wanting my own studio my whole life. And I, you know, I kind of had a little shitty one for a long time, but um, it was like, good. <laughs> Ted's going on tour. <laughs> like, I can use the time off. I know some of the other, the other, some of the other guys were very happy about that decision, but mm -hmm. luckily I was. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, Mike, let's get to something important here instead of talking about Cold Chamber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> carcass. I heard you on the Toomey podcast talking about Carcass. Oh, and, carcass. and I could not have been happier as a Carcass freak. So talk a little bit. What, what do you, if you found somebody that did not know of Carcass, what do you hand them and what song off of that do you tell them to listen to? Oh, God, anything off Heartwork. I know there's a lot of people that like Necroticism better, but I'm a Heartwork fan. That is 
like I said on the other podcast, I mean, that record and I would say the Hinder by Doth are my two favorite death metal records of all time. Sure. Did, did what'd you think of, um, of the last one that they did the comeback? I thought it was good, but you know, it's, it's kind of like Metallica releasing a new record. You know, it's like hardwired to self-destruct is a really, really solid record. But it's just not ever going to be, you know, ride the lightning mm. through the black album. Right. Before. Yeah. You true. Know, it's mm-hmm. never going to do it. There's a time and a place. And it's like, I think when you first discover a band, there's, I don't know, it's like, hard work is some big shoes to fill. It'd be oh, yeah. really hard to top that record. I mean, Jesus Christ, that record is, <laughs> is so amazing. And I think I remember, I was a kid, when was it released? Like 94 or something like that? Uh, 93, I think. Yeah, 93, 94, somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I was, so I was, let's see, let's say it was released in 93, I was uh, 12 years old, and it was on Headbangers Ball, the song Hard right. Mm-hmm. And I think Christmas was right around the corner, and my mom, all I wanted was CDs for Christmas. So I'd give her a list of some CDs, and she and my sister went to uh, Tower Records back in the day. And I didn't, for some reason, I didn't write down Carcass. I wrote down Caress. <laughs> <laughs> Com- completely oh, different. So, you know, I'm, my mom, and she told me the story after she gave it to me for Christmas, but... Um, you know, they were they got one of the guys that worked at Tower Records, and you know, were trying to figure out, looking for this Heartwork CD by Caress, and he, I guess he finally looked it up, and it's like, <laughs> no, no, the band is Carcass, and my, my mom and sister are just like, well, that makes a lot more sense, judging by the music. <laughs> and uh, uh. yeah, and I, I, I listen to that record until my ears bleed. I mean, I still put it on from time to time. Same, same. This mortal coil does not go a month without getting played at least once in my in my phone, man. Such good stuff. What what, uh, what is what is track number nine? That's another one of my favorites. Um, um, the expletive song. Um, God damn it. Doc doctrine doc, yes. doctrine expletives. Right. Yeah, do, doctrinal expli- <laughs> expletives. I can't even pronounce it. Expletives. 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 There you go. Expletives. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I just recently put a Carcass playlist on my phone because their stuff isn't available on Spotify. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, what's up with that? Well, you yeah. have to ask them. They must, they must think they can still sell CDs or something and don't, don't need the Spotify. Yeah, it's usually a record label thing and... I mean, their new album is up on Spotify, but I, their old catalog isn't. At least it wasn't last time I checked. Yeah, I hear you. Well, one one catalog that is definitely there is Devil Driver. And um, Mike, when when is um when is the new release out for the public? Dealing with demons, part one. Our uh, October second. Okay. Was well, going to be October 9th, but we pushed it up a week. Very good. And w- and where should people go to keep up with with you guys and buy it and all that good stuff? Oh, there are, well, there are pre-orders available and you can find a link for those on the Devil Driver site or any of our Instagram pages. I got it up on my Instagram page right now. Okay. And uh, it'll be available everywhere. Spotify, Apple Music, probably Amazon as well. And uh, pretty much anywhere people stream music these days, you can find it. It's coming out on vinyl. Actually, I think we're even releasing it on a cassette. (laughs) I think there's some oh. bundles that have cassettes in them because some people have been wanting cassettes again. Which, which I don't get. Why? Why? Yeah, they sound yeah. horrible. Horrible. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. The last thing <laughs> I want to listen to is our record on a cassette. I mean, I don't even have a cassette yeah. player, so I wouldn't be able to play it anyway. But Right. <laughs> I kind of do want a copy of it, though. Right. See? There you go. <laughs> That's why. That's why. <laughs> That's why, because fans will yeah. buy it. You know, It'll never get played. It'll just... Be on like a like somewhere item. in my house, dude. I promise <laughs> you, if you if you pressed fifty on eight tracks, someone would buy them. Oh yeah, probably, <laughs> mm-hmm. no doubt. Yeah. Well, Mike, dude, thanks so much for coming on, man. We definitely appreciate it. And everybody, make sure you go to DevilDriver.com and pick up the new release, uh, dealing with demons. Thanks for having right. me, you guys. Thanks a lot, Mike. Take, Take care, care, buddy. All right, see ya. 
Thanks for listening to Aftershocks. For more episodes, go to our website at www.aftershockspodcast.com. Visit us on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for more news and information on the podcast. And be sure to subscribe, listen to, and review all episodes on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other podcast platforms. For your music listening pleasure, visit our website or go to www.shockwavesradio.com for all comments and questions. Please email us at info at aftershockspodcast.com.